Thomas Allen with the number two floor on the coming line. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, my plan for today is to continue with a bit of a discussion about uh, what happens in the, in the case of general mineral structures. Uh, tell you something about the very basic theory that's uh, it's just always works in all mineral structures. The kind of thing that's really you, uh, you, you might do better to study from Van Vitu's book, but I'll tell you about it. And uh, then I, I hope to finish today with the discussion of the content, allowing us to down to how many rational points might have on the final assessment of the structures. Okay, so as we attended uh, yesterday, I was telling you that this uh, cell decomposition theorem that Spanish just proves the case when you have an omenal structure on the real, on the reals actually works under the much weaker assumption just that you have an omenal structure, period. So we have an ordered set with some additional structure in the sense of first order logic. So you're allowed new function symbols, new relation symbols. But even with those extra relation symbols and function symbols, in the given structure, in one variable, all you can define are the sets that you could define using the ordering without uh, any quantifiers. So just saying points and so you mean that the, the completeness requirement can be omitted? Yes, the completeness requirement can be omitted. Well, two things either. One, the completeness requirements. So I don't need to assume that it's actually the order type of the reals. And the other thing that you can omit is you can omit this strong omenality condition. Which was a condition about every structure that had the same theory in the sense of first order logic as the first structure, which, as you pointed out yesterday, how are you supposed to check it? Okay, that's uh, that's you know, if you've proven some kind of a quantum combination theorem for the whole theory or something, maybe that's fine. But usually it's very difficult to actually check that. And we don't have to. So you just need to look under one structure for the sets that you can find that one structure, it's the case of the, of the in one variable, you get points and intervals. And you can use those. The answer to that is yes. Then you can prove cell decomposition. Uh, and let me tell you a little something about what's involved in the proof. Not much, because it's it's pretty much the same proof as Andrew's proof, except you know, it's good. You, know, you have to a little bit that way because you have to deal with the fact that you can't you can't do the really simple kinds of first year real analysis arguments. Talked about yesterday. Those don't quite work. Still elementary, but not every sequence of points is increasing as a limit. Okay, so right, you can't, can't just take limits the way you would in the reals. Uh, it doesn't quite work as nicely, but it's still true. And what's uh, what changes? The, there are two major changes in the proof that you have to deal with. The first one is that we had to prove that every Definable function one variable is uh, continuous, except to find the points. And, uh, and so I, I showed you Gandhi's argument for that, which just involves basic you know, one variable real analysis. Well, okay, you have to you have to push repeatedly using the using the hypothesis of a minimality and you get some crazy situation where you have some function going up and down over the place, but somehow eventually you can make it work. Okay, so it's an elementary argument. You can find the details written out in Van Peer's book. It's written out in his papers. I actually, there's a difference of opinion in this room as to which source is the better source to go. I like the original papers. They're, uh, you know, they do feel a bit like a Ruth Goldberg machine. You've got pushing through uh, everything we have to do to make it work, but it works. Okay, so you go down this rabbit hole and eventually everything it works. Uh, in the, uh, in Van Andrie's book, it's maybe a bit more streamlined, but you know, it's not, to me, it's more fun to uh, look at how they, how they wish to do it. Um, the real serious change in the proof comes in the proof of cell decomposition. Well, remember what we did in the proof of cell decomposition is we, we took our definable set and we said, well, look at the boundary points. Yeah, so you, you have like, <laughs> in plus one variables, and it's parametrically, well, you just have to find what the boundary points are and you look in between those, and that's that's going to give you a cell decomposition. If you know that there's a bound on how many boundary points you have uniformly across the family, then you just write 
first boundary point, second boundary point derivative, and so on as definable functions. Use use induction to say that those functions are continuous, and everything works out beautifully. Well, that's what strong minimality says. Strong minimality says that there's a bound on the number of boundary points that you might have. If you don't assume that, maybe it changes. So as you go along, the first point to look at, there are five boundary points. The next one, there are 500. And you keep going, you keep growing, right? Well, what do you do then? And uh, that's well, that's a problem. Okay, you so- use the set of discontinuity the points uh, definable. Yes. Okay, so now, yes, it is definable. And that maybe it's a good point that I didn't write down yesterday. I'm not going to write it down. But basically, the epsilon delta definitions that you know for continuity, the epsilon delta the definition right now for differentiability, we have a bit of field around. Those you can write for sort of formats <laughs> because that's what they are. You're saying that for every epsilon is greater than zero, there exists a delta, which is also greater than zero. So for everything in a certain range, something happens. That's the first order form. And so, means that checking continuity is a definable condition. Checking differentiability, if you at least have the field operations, that's a first order. That's a first order condition. So, so you can you assume something about all those sets. You assume that those sets of discontinuity points, there's one variable, are going to be finding these points in Okay, so what they have to, have to deal with is really what, what you want to show. Uh, if you now want to go back and really deal with the problem, the one that I talked to yesterday with the salty composition, is you wanted to show that if you have a family of finite sets, so if you have this definable set A, and it lives, well, I'll, draw, I'll try to draw in this corner here. It's, uh, it lives over your base here, and A looks something like this. Maybe. Well, I, I'm doing maybe it doesn't look quite like that because I'm doing a set where A I'm looking where it's finite, where the projection is finite over the over the space. What you'd like to show is that you can decompose the base into finally pieces like this. So that's over each of these pieces, this family, the set A, looks like a covering space. Right? So that's it just comes with finally these sheets. And uh, if you knew that there was a bound as to how many how many pieces you have along the way, then you could do that. It wouldn't, wouldn't be so bad. They don't know that. That's not part of our hypothesis. Our hypothesis is just that it's finite. Um, somehow, that's it. That's, that's really all that all really, really assuming. So you really have to, you have to work. And they, uh, they somehow analyze what would go wrong if you have points which are not good. So here I've been talking about their definition of they call it goods. Uh, basically, it's that at every point over the, at this point down here, every point above here, it looked like a covering space. They have to show that's actually almost every point is good. And you know, it's work, they're not gonna go through, but it's, uh, you know, it's been done. Okay, so once it's been done once, you never have to think about it again. So we're done thinking about it. And uh, then, and then you can improve the solving composition. So once you know that's almost every point is good, then the argument I told you yesterday, now that works fine. Because it's a bounded number of boundary points, and you take each of those and it's going between them and you get the solving composition. Uh, they also have to remember that I said that in order to keep the induction going, you need to show that every function, even in invariables, is almost everywhere continuous. And uh, if you're dealing with the case where it's on the reals, well, the kind of basic real analysis argument I told you yesterday, that's where it's fine. It doesn't in this general context, but the theorem is still true. Okay, so you have to, to work harder in order to prove that uh, you get that someone that very continuous, but it works. And so uh, once you know that it works, then you can forget that that was ever an issue. Okay, so I'd like to mention a little something about some very new results. And uh, it's unfortunate that Gal is an organizer. We love at least maybe it's not unfortunate for you, but it's that's good for us because see, if I did, we produce a nice program, which you're not going to be explaining to us how this how this works. I actually do give a talk. Oh, you're giving a talk? Okay, good. So, so he's going to explain, explain it in detail how all this how all this works. Uh, 
So, okay, let's find the detail at how all this works. So, we'll just, I'm not, as you can see, I'm not really fun in AP class, but let's, uh, if you're a little bit more careful about how you quantitatively describe the definable sets and the quantitative description that's used goes into the notion of having these two parameters, the format and the degree. Uh, degree actually kind of corresponds to degree, the way that you think about the degree ought, ought to mean. So if your definable sets is given as, a, say, a hypersurface defined by a polynomial of degree D, then its degree is at most D. Yeah, that's, that's great. So that's that actually kind of, kind of fits with what you think degree ought to mean. A format has something you, well, format is just something else. Okay? So it's, somehow it's, it's, it's another parameter. Uh, it has to do with how many variables you have to use, might have something to do with how many projections are involved in the presentation, presentation of the set. So how should we think of degree in the case of an analytic set or X? Uh, well, that's actually, what is the degree of X? What? This one? But what, first of all, we haven't formally proven that our X in Sharpie are minimal yet, although it's in the works. But I mean, you should think that you have some, say, E to the X is some fixed degree, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And that when you put polynomials in these functions, then the degree would be like uh, mm -hmm. the degree of those polynomials. And mm -hmm. how do you build that set? Yeah. Yeah. So, the, so maybe just to add my own understanding of this is just that, yeah, then these numbers are formatted in degree. They, are truly meaningful to me in the case when you're really talking about polynomial, but they really are, are there to give some kind of numerical bounds. So it's not so much that they ought to be thought of as some intrinsic notion of a uh, kind of numerical, meaningful numerical property of the definable set. But if you want to prove some kind of bounds as to how many pieces you might need in order to decompose some definable sets, good. It's 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 true that most practical reasons want to think of degree of exponential as being just one. Yeah, it doesn't matter because it's only a filtration, as as Tom said. It's kind of it's not really uniquely defined. The whole filtration is defined. If you, you know, you can always change it a little bit, and you would get a different filtration, and they would be equivalent in some sense. But it doesn't really make sense to pinpoint a specific number for the degree of the x. Can you then assign a formal? Uh, the way we do it is just we introduce a filtration, we introduce some equivalence between these filtrations, and then everything is defined up to this equivalent. So <laughs> it's all infinite filtration, it has meaning. So you point to one piece of the filtration, it doesn't really make sense. You can change the filtration a little bit, and asymptotically, you will get the same kind of behavior. But what about the format? What kind of information does this structure? It's like if you define, let's say, something using formulas. And it's counting how many um, quantifies you had in the formula and how many variables you had there. That's the way to look at I mean, so certainly the format would be bounded by this. If you had a formula, you count how many quantifiers and variables, and this would be a bound for the format of what <laughs> formulas. So we'll hear a lot more detail on this in here today. So I just uh, state the theorem that we proved. So the, the theorem, well, one, if they prove a number of exciting theorems, okay, but the one, at least as far as the cell decomposition goes, is that if you have this notion of degree and format, this notion of degree and format for the definable sets uh, of your, in this ONL structure, then when you do a cell decomposition, you're supposed to be compatible with some sequence of definable sets, the number of cells and the complexity of the cells that, that you need be bounded by the format and degree of the of the original sets that you're trying to uh, decompose, and the bound is polynomial in the in that number of sets and, and the degrees. Yeah. So the bound does not depend on the format. No, the, which polynomial? So it's which polynomial? polynomial is, yeah. Uh, yeah, the polynomial also depends on which which end is on. So this is a kind of Gazoo theorem uh, for uh, cell decomposition. Sure. Yeah, that's kind of good. It's like a Bayesian theorem, although it's so the Bayesian theorem is maybe like built into the definition of degree and properties that that degree has. But, but if you think about the format, something like a uh, substitute, a complicated substitute for the dimension, then it would be exactly like uh, Gazoo type thing. Products of degrees. Products of degrees or yeah, although it's again not, it's not quite as tight as Bayesian's theorem. 
Uh, but uh, yeah, but just in the sense that the Bezu bound, let's say you have any equations of degree D, then the bound is D to the N. So it's like exponential in N, which is like from R, but it's polynomial in D, which is integral as well. In this case, this is asymptotic size. And so uh, you'll hear more about this later this week. The, uh, not every ominal structure is sharply ominal, or not every ominal structure can be. Uh, and, well, and you'll hear, it doesn't really make sense to say that a structure is sharply ominal, it's really more that there's some choice of the, of the filtration to make the sharply ominal. It doesn't always work. But for many of the cases that are interesting to us, it's known to be yes. Actually, for one, for some of the cases that are interesting because it's known to be no, but that's that's like maybe more that's uh, more than we're going to hear about later this week. Okay, so I'd just like to tell you just because you should know, and because I know that's I told you you should go and read this paper if you're not going to. So I'm going to <laughs> tell you what you're missing. Okay? And you're missing some interesting things, uh, in the interesting things in these papers. Uh, so I want to tell you a few results that other kinds of results that appear in the uh, in the basic original papers of uh, Steinman and Pillay and Knight on ominal structures. Uh, that's you know that's so they're embedded there that we don't really people just don't talk about. It. They probably should. Okay, so the first one that I was saying is that there are speedo ominal structures that you don't need to think about. Okay? So that's pretty much what they they prove. So the if we take the natural numbers considered as ordered sets, that is ominous. Well, no. And uh, it might seem a little strange because you know it's discrete, and so you can start defining. I already told you that it's how uniformly defining finite, you know, finite versus infinite. You can't do that here okay? because the interval from zero up to n has well, if I start at zero and include n, I guess it has infinite elements. That's grown, right? So I have this. It seems. To violate what this saying about the uniform bounds on the number of number of boundary points, it's turned out not to be a problem, but also turns out that it's you can kind of ignore this. Right? So they what they prove is that uh, these discrete dominal structures really are just ordered sets where you have the ordered set which look more or less like the natural numbers or the integers, and maybe the extra structure you have is you have some you have some you have a definable uh, increasing function or decreasing function you find these things. And that's it. There's nothing really interesting to have in the in the discrete fields. Okay, so it's nice to prove that for us. So we're gonna have to think about that. Sorry, I'll tell you about that. So the field of composition fails on this case? No, it's okay. It's okay. okay. Yeah, so that's it. that's paper three. So paper three, they prove solving composition for discrete structures. Okay. So, the bound thing. You know the bounding doesn't work. So you don't have so you have to redefine what you mean by boundary. So boundary is not going to be bound to top level of boundary because like, top level boundary might be used. But it's like it's where the intervals where you change one interval to another interval and so So it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah like, sorry. So you're saying that uh, these theorems actually report without the free structure. That's right. The theorems that you mentioned before. Yes. And how about definable choice? I haven't, I haven't mentioned the final choice yet. I, I'm sure. Uh, the final choice does not. It does not. Yeah. So the final choice, you need, well, okay. you can make it work even without this, but the minimum reasonable assumption is that you have a group structure and at least one non zero element to the names, and then you have the final choice. But uh, yeah. yeah, so the final choice, actually, in discrete structures, it does work. If they're discrete, and so you can make you can the final choice work there. But if you did something like uh, this cube or R with less than, that's a structure, that's a minimal, it doesn't have the findable choice. Because how do you pick you, how do you pick an element in, in an interval? You can't go in the middle because you can't divide, right? So you can't actually pick the points uh, uniformly. Uh, so from from the model theoretic point of view. One of the most important results of the approach is, is pretty easy in moment of malady, is that these structures, what are called NIP, uh, do not have the independent problem. Not the independence property, which was named in honor of Shellock's uh, way of naming things. So he doesn't actually call this, he calls it dependent, as in not independent. So it's, it's, uh, it's dependent. Um, somehow people didn't pick that up. So it's NIP. Uh, which might say a okay, big deal, okay, some silly combinatorial thing, 
No, it's, it's actually an important combinatorial property for these. Uh, these <laughs> and so what this what this means okay, in the combinatorial language, people would say that they have finite adaptive determinicus dimension, right? Every definable family has finite adaptive determinicus dimension, which means that you cannot uniformly pick out all subsets, finite sets, by varying along family uh, family sets. This has consequences to machine learning has consequences in, in the common torques of hyperplane arrangements or arrangements of uh, some algebraic sets. Interesting stuff. I'm not going to talk about. Uh, they do characterize what all omenimal fields and groups look like. And every omenimal group is a divisible order to be in the group. And maybe it's more structure, but it's yes. so, that's it. That's one of the kinds of groups you have. Every ring, well, every every ring which doesn't have zero divisors, uh, is a real close field. And one interesting point about this in these in these theorems, you assume that you have that the the group structure on a monal structure. So I have multiplication, and I have less than or equal to. I'm not assuming that those are related. Okay, other than that's the structure is all minimal, and it follows that. Yeah, actually, they are. They actually, they actually are, are related. That's this will be an ordered group relative to this relative to this ordering, and it's just a ordered group. Likewise with the ring. So if you have a field which is all minimal with respect to some choice in ordering, actually the ordering has to be the natural ordering, which comes from squares, and uh, has to be has to be a real close field. Yeah. Uh, they also characterize elephant categorical minimal structures. They also cannot not be interesting. So they characterize it, but they characterize it for using what think about it. They aren't they aren't interesting. Uh, I want to mention another theorem, which is uh, another really beautiful paper, which uh, hasn't hasn't been used as much as it should be. So I'm just going to, to, to tell you to tell you about this. Uh, this is uh, the results of Pedersel and Sarchenko. Where they show that basically there are well, there are three basic kinds of omenal structures. So really you have to do this locally because I could have one structure on one interval, another structure on another interval, and they're not connected. Okay, so you have to look locally. And you look at the actual statements, it's they have to make some some, some generosity hypothesis. Let's shut down the right. Okay, so I'm just talking about the basic structure of structures. So there are three possibilities. One possibility. Is that it's basically just an ordered set, maybe with an increasing function or a decreasing function. That's it. Nothing like, totally trivial, totally uninteresting. Second possibility is it looks like an ordered vector space. So it looks like just uh, the, the rationals with, with ordering and addition. Maybe you're just looking locally. So you take a, take a neighborhood and that's, and that's, that's what it looks like. It looks like in the sense that the only functions that you can define. Are those which look which are linear relative to the relative to the group structure uh, that you have? And that's that might be true. One, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, mm, no, necessarily. It's so like the reals are. Uh, there would be an example. So the reals as a as a group. That's an infinite dimensional vector space over Q. But it's ordered, and it's, okay. yeah. So no, I don't necessarily mean so it's ordered. So it's an ordered vector space, and the only definable sets you have locally look are linear. So that's the it's the second part that where my book you know, the kind of form it out. And if you go anything beyond that, so if you have anything just non-linear, it's not at least locally not built up kind of piecewise linear functions, then you have a real close field, and then. It actually doesn't stop there if you can keep going, but uh, do you at least have a real close field? Now, why is that so? What's how is this usually used? It's usually used by saying that, well, whenever we talk about an nominal structure, unless we're doing something like tropical geometry, in which case we'd be in case two, we might as well assume we're in case three. So we might as well say, yeah, we have a field because we have to. If there's anything at all interesting going on, anything beyond linear, you have to have a field. So you might as well just get up to yourself. When you're talking about one of these, of these structures. So how is this uh, proven? 
it's proven by, by showing that he somehow interprets tangency just synthetically. So you can start with a family of curves passing through passing through some points and uh, recognize what it means for two of these curves to be tangents by thinking about how many points of intersection do you have when you move them, move them a little bit. Okay, so if you have family of curves, it's, it's not always because you have to you have to adjust something, but if you have a reasonable family of curves. And it's a big enough dimensional family. Yeah, and two of them curve, it's the usual parameterized curve. Uh, and now, what I mean is a subset of R cross R, which is one dimensional and passes through a given point. So, not so not they may be singular. What? They may be singular. They may be singular. Yeah, they may be singular, but in, yes, yeah, so there's work you have to do to argue that you can reduce the case or at, at the point you're interested in. Most of them are, are smooth. But you're right. They, they, they might be singular. They might not be defined everywhere. They might have they, they might have holes. They might have uh, they might have multiple components. So that so there are many things that might happen that you have to adjust to actually run the arguments. But they run the argument down to the point where you get it to where they are smooth at the point that you're interested in. And then you have to ask, well, how do you tell whether two of these guys are tangent to each other? And well, that's just synthetic geometry. So you move them a little bit, and if you have more intersection points when you move them, then they rise that you have before. Tangent. And so then they can interpret the, the tangent simulation without actually doing, without having any arithmetic, without having without having the parameterization by, by the field around, and recover, say, multiplication by, by composing curves. So when you, when you compose two curves, then the, you multiply, the, multiply the, the tangent direction. So they can then recover addition by uh, differentiating this again. Uh, so it's and synthetic geometry, which allows you to recover, recover the field structure. So I think a really beautiful paper. It's it's based upon some ideas of Zilbert, uh, which were connected to recovering field structure in the case of algebraic closed fields. His approach didn't quite work. Isn't it uh, equivalent in a sense to the Nash construction uh, resolution of singularity? Equivalent to? I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't say equivalent to. I mean, maybe it's. I'm sure that there are connections in the in the construction, but now I wouldn't say. Equivalent. Is it similar to an abelian geometry when you recover? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So it's kind of it's more like yeah. So it's like an abelian geometry, in the sense that we have some limited amounts of information, uh, some limited limited amount of geometric information, and somehow by doing geometric operations, you can recover the whole. I, I guess similar operation. Yeah. So that's the I mean, the yeah, the high level principle. What's what's going on? But the conclusion that that we really use is this last one. That if there's any interesting structure, you have a real close fit. I mean, might as well assume that's what you have. Okay. So for the next uh, twenty minutes or so, I'm going to just do basic basic analysis. Uh, and as I played yesterday, really you can think of O minimality as saying that uh, that you don't have to think too hard about uh, possible topologies that you might have in the definable sets of behavior in behavior. So one one fact which just follows O minimality is that limits always exist. Now I say limits exist. Well, one set limits. It's not true that two set limits always exist, but one set limits always exist. As long as you allow me to have plus or minus infinity as possible, value. so you might have a function that goes to infinity and goes to infinity. That's I mean, that, that's a lot. Might go to negative infinity, but you always get a limit. And the proof, and this is well, it's the complete proof, this comes on to the C term. All right, so we know that our function is continuous and monotone piecewise. So break this into pieces, and like you cut the interval and somewhat whatever is starting at a, some part where it's going to be continuous monotone or constant. If it's constant, well, that's the limit. Okay, so the limit of constant function we all we all know to take the limit. Take the limit. If it's monotone, well, monotone functions, monotone continuous functions are going to take an interval to an interval, and the limit is going to be one of the endpoints of the interval you get. Okay, in the story, and so you uh, you can. Computes limits always, which uh, again makes doing 
basic real analysis with the uh, ominal definable functions, all the much easier. You don't have to worry about oscillation. I mean, it's it, it, it gets one possible option. Uh, here's another consequence, which I'm writing in the, with the, in the logical language of with formulas. And that is that you can define what it means to be infinite. So usually you can't do that for sort of the logic, but you can in a minimal structure. So you have a formula here, it has lots of parameter variables in one uh, object variable. And I can say about y1 through yn that they're infinitely many solutions. Now, okay, I wrote it down, but this basically just says they're infinitely many solutions if and only if the whole interval that's satisfies the formula. Okay, that's it. Now, one thing that you might say, aha, you told me that's in less than was so minimal, this doesn't work there. Okay, something that I didn't say, I just but I wrote, I wrote it, I didn't say it on the last slide, is we're no longer ever thinking about discrete structures. Okay, those don't exist. And so uh, we're only talking about the case where we have where we have, where we have a dense order. And so for a dense order, you can find what it means to be in this. And then you can extend this to many variables, many variables if you like. You can define, didn't write it down, but you can define what it means, say, to have non-empty interior, something in your in a set this defined. There's just the usual definition of, of openness, something about you can write with the first other form, about there being a box inside of the inside of the set that's, that's defined. Uh, and choice functions, something that Scal was asking about. Uh, you can always define choice functions, by which I mean that if you have a family of definable sets parameterized by some other some other definable sets. So I have X lives in the n plus n variables. You project it down to n variables, this is my B. And I want to know, can I pick for each B some elements back up and back up in X? And if we make a little bit of an assumption, so it doesn't work in every one structure, but every one that you're ever going to worry about it does. We assume that you, can, you at least have a group structure. I assume that I, I know one element which is positive. I'm calling one. If you want to call it a half? That's fine with me. But whatever you want to call it, there's some non-zero element that you that you give yourself, and then maybe more structure. But I don't care about the extra structure. Okay, so if it's all minimal, then you can pick out. You can uniformly pick out elements uh, from the from the definable sets, and how do you do it? Well, okay, really, I'd say you can do it with a family of sets that are m-dimensional. Uh, you really only have to do the case where it was one. Okay, so this, is, this we do by, by induction. You know, I do it by induction on n plus m. And that's, if I want to pick out, say that I'm, I'm trying to pick out elements from a set of size, you know, where it's n plus two, so here. But I first project the first n plus one variables. And apply the dimension one case and it allows me to pick out elements there. And then you have to pick out from the n plus one, and then you compose this two and you get the, get the choice of all. So really it's just the case of one you have to worry about. And uh pair the forms, right? So it's like an if then else kind of uh construction. All right, so one possibility is that zero is an element of your fiber. Okay, that might happen. Pick that. Okay, and you can check that's the final condition that zero is an element of your fiber. And so it's there, that's what I pick. Maybe it's not. Okay, so it's not there. Then uh, you look at the set, this XB, the fiber. Maybe, remember, it's a, it's a unit of points and intervals. Maybe it has some isolated points. Maybe there's some points in that presentation. And if there are, pick the least one. That's the, that's the final. So say I'm the least isolated points in the fiber. Pick that. <laughs> All right, maybe that didn't work. Maybe there are no isolated points, right? but uh, maybe there's an interval, the interval between A and B. That's and A and B are actual numbers; they aren't just uh, minus infinity or plus infinity. So if that happens, well, you can find the first interval, which appears as part of your presentation, and pick the point halfway in between A and B. Because remember that your group has to be divisible. So in particular, I can divide by two, and the points we divide, you know, the average is in between is between A and B. Maybe that didn't work. You don't actually have one of these intervals A to B in your presentation. Well, it's all minimal. It doesn't have any points. It doesn't have any intervals. It doesn't contain, it doesn't contain zero. 
Well, then it's, it has to contain an interval from minus infinity up to some points or from some point up to plus infinity. And if it's the first one where it's from uh, minus infinity up to points, then just subtract one from that point. That's going to be an interval. And it goes the other way, then add. And that's it. Okay, that gives you a way to pick, pick elements. Not <laughs> difficult, when I say this is so trivial why you're telling it. Right? And I, I agree. It's like not hard, but that's the point. Yeah, the point is that omnimality is not part. Okay, that's it's it actually comes to work in the way that you the way that you'd like like to move the world. Yeah, but of course, this section it's I mean it's not always very continuous, right? No, it's not continuous. Yeah, and it's, there's no way that it's not as not necessarily continuous. There are cases where it couldn't possibly be continuous. So I'm not claiming that there are continuous sections always. Uh, it's piecewise continuous. It's definable, and so hence I can decompose the into the cells where it's continuous on those on the cells, but you know, can't do better than that. All right. Uh, another nice consequence, the uh, topological finiteness kind of consequence. The family of definable sets. Say I'm doing it in the real, so that's the usual topological solutions apply. Uh, then no, I find only homeomorphism types. That you get amongst the sets that are here. Basically, because you can do cell decomposition uniformly, or maybe what I should say is the cell decomposition proof I gave you yesterday was really a proof of cylindrical cell, cell decomposition. So that you project gets, yeah, you still get families of cells. So the, the shape of the cell decomposition you get not only finally many that's that might appear in this, in this family. And you can read off the, the topology from the cell decomposition. Yeah, I'm not sure that's accurate. So like, actually, it's, it's much harder to make a triangulation that you can read uh, the moment is implied from. If, yeah, you start with something, yeah, but okay. then there is yeah. anything the triangulation. Okay, yes, yes, you're right. Yeah, so there's not, yeah, because you have to, there's this annoyance that's in the proof. The way we define a cell decomposition, you have to decide what's going to happen at the, at, at the edge. And that can be different. And so you have to then break into different cases. And you have to, yeah, yeah the cells yeah. don't, they, they are yeah. each homeomorphic structure, but they don't give you a simplicial complex, but you can subdivide. You can, sub you can subdivide to make it into such a complex, but not, but not, not the cell, cell decomposition won't be a, won't be a uh, simple to complex, you can build a such a complex from the cell decomposition. So now, in Lau's book, he does it. Uh, another consequence of cell decomposition, or really, if the gal is pointing out, is, do it with the triangulation. Uh, so that's the betting numbers are all finites. Uh, in fact, these would be you know, as much as zero once and get big enough uniformly. And you can actually say this for arbitrary liminal structures if you have to redefine what you mean by topology. Now, there's a there's an obvious topology that you should use, which is the order topology, but it doesn't have a nice, really nice properties if you're not actually an R. So uh, in fact, uh, I think in every every nominal structure where the underlying order is not R, the topology is totally disconnected. It's uh, a little bit disconcerting if you're trying to do trying to do real analysis kinds of things. So you redefine what you mean by topology. So you work with growth topologies, and you redefine what you mean by connected. So uh, definably connected. So you, you talked about. Uh, curves as being definable maps from intervals in the sense of your structure into the, into the into whatever top of the space you're looking at. So you have to redefine these redefine these appropriately. It works. There's a really nice theory of uh, algebraic topology which has been developed for ominal structures, arbitrary ominal structures. Uh, say the person who's done most of this work is Samori with Mundo, although there are other people uh, involved in this work. So the context would have some kind of Brower fix point here. Uh, do we have a Brower fix point? No, I actually don't know. Do we have a Brower fix point here? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Now we're referring to the degree one for real algebraic sets. Yeah. So it's, assuming it's compact to five. Yeah. Probably, I'm not sure. 
So I mean, really, algebraic to even the usual ring topology, you get a lot of standard graph. So what do you mean by the real algebraic graph? Well, I mean like you did with the with the algebraic function. Semi-algebraic over any field yourself. Yeah. Well, we follow because so if you know it, you know it's yeah. So this is this is actually one way that Tarski's theorem is used is that you might you might want to prove things about every real close field to my algebraic sets over over any field. And you can use usual topological arguments yeah. over the reals, provided that what you're expressing is something which is just about an expressing the algebraic language. Then it's true in every in every uh, close field. I will have some examples of opposite many group up and new for real fields using some definable exact yeah, so yeah, so the okay, there are proofs of okay, I forgot which which number in Tarski's problem this is about. So that's uh all the definite functions of sums of squares. Whose problem is this? Yeah, number it's maybe well, like a you know, which number? Well, whichever one is not the pico is 17. 17, number 17. Okay, uh, yeah, so there are yeah, there are ways of arguing that using non standard uh -huh. models and then you fall back down to the real. Yeah. So also the first group of only multiple of Rx by which is really non standard. Oh, yeah. oh yeah, so in the uh okay, the counting theorem, which oh yeah, I think we will be talking about today, the original proof of that also goes is done in non-standard models. So even though it might only that's even stated only for the reals. Okay, the theorem is about the reals, but the proof involves working non-standard models. Okay, so another basic property that we have in you know, structures is that provided you at least have a field structures, it makes sense to talk about derivatives. Every function is differential. And again, not everywhere. I mean, you can decompose it into, into finally new cells for the domain, whereas differential elements. And uh, up to CK. So I pointed out yesterday, you cannot replace CK as C infinity. So uh, in general, or the lambda. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit about this proof because it's, I won't go into complete detail, but I'll point out what's involved here. Again, really, it's just the case of n equals one, k equals one that matters. Tom, excuse me, I want to get back. We cannot uh, replace CK by the C infinity, or we have, or we do have examples. When this there are examples. Happens. There are examples. I probably should have looked up one of the examples last night, but couldn't. But there are examples known. Of O and L structures in which you have a definable function, which is not almost everywhere the same thing. So it has n many points at which, for some k, it's not k times the function. It's Margaret Thomas. Margaret Thomas has a paper on this. And I think there were, there were earlier examples uh, due to Wilkie from 1825 or so, where uh, it shows that's. But his examples are maybe less explicit. So I mean, Margaret's example is pretty explicit. But it's examples where you can't you can't get a free scene. Um, I'll look up the I'll, I'll look up this example and, and, and show it to you the bottom. Okay. All right. So really, the case we're going to look at is k equals one k equals one, and by the continuity theorem, really we just need to show it's differential because if it's you know, the derivative is exists almost everywhere, well, then break it up by the more steps and it's continuous. Okay, so the usual principle of nominality, if it goes wrong, it goes wrong everywhere. So there's a whole interval where it goes wrong. So you have some interval where you have this continuous function, which is nowhere differential. Now, those exist, but not in no minimal world. And the reason basically is that, remember, one-sided derivatives, one-sided limits exist. So when you compute the derivative using the usual formula for computing the derivative, well, just do it on one side and the other side. That will make sense. That's going to exist. That's going to exist on one side. Maybe it gives you infinity. Okay, so I said it exists. Maybe it gives you infinity. Maybe it gives you minus infinity. But these exist. And now you just start doing really kind of very basic kind of checks with, uh, with, with the calculus. And you see that okay, it's not going to plus or minus infinity very often. Maybe finally, the point that happens, it can't be a whole interval where it's infinity. 
you check that the function is going to be increasing if the derivative is positive, it's decreasing if one of these one sided derivatives is, is, is negative. We know our functions are almost everywhere positive or you know, increasing or decreasing. Well, it was actually negative. So it's, uh, you know, there's some work and it's done in detail. It's the, the whole argument. You write out all the, all the epsilon developers in the proof and the page and a half, but it's, it works. Okay, so you get so those functions are differential. And that's in one variable, two variables, in variables. All right, so there's more basic minimality we could do, but I'm going to stop with basic minimality and move on to non basic minimality. And uh, this is, it's this theorem that's uh, ties, ties a minimality back to back to geometry, back to die geometry. Uh, but the paper that I'm that, uh, listed here is by uh, Jonathan Pila and Alex Wilkie, where they show that you can bound the number of rational points on definable sets in nominal, in nominal structures on the reals. Uh, so the first time that I heard about this paper, well, not this paper, but this kind of results, uh, yeah, I think I was listening to a lecture by Alex Wilkie uh, in the early 2000s. I had flown overnight to go to uh, Birmingham to listen to him talk. And I had been requested by my postdoc to take detailed notes I thought he was saying because I'm really important. I have to take people notes. My notes have all these lines where I fell asleep. Right, and so I, <laughs> and I brought them back. Uh, Matthias couldn't actually tell like, how the proof works because I was asleep during the during the proof. Uh, not that it wasn't interesting. It was very interesting, but I just could not stay awake uh, to, to take these notes. Uh, it seems it just seemed wrong you know, because what I was telling you that's the natural numbers, the integers, they have a horrible theory. It's not tame at all. There's no way you could possibly, I mean, you know, people do number theory, but people are, are impressed when you do number theory because it's hard. It's, you know, we know that they can't be done, right? And uh, there's no way you could possibly say anything with these, like, these continuous functions, like beautiful theory. I just told you like, it's like, Easy first year calculus kind of things. That's that's all you do when you're doing global normality. How could it possibly tell you anything at all about counting rational points? Uh, but it does. Okay. And here, you know, it does. And not only does it tell you something, but it has consequences to diaphragm and geometry. So I think that Philip is going to really go through in some detail uh, using this uh, using this example from uh, uh as to what you can actually say in diaphragm and geometry using uh, using the counting theorem. So the the counting theorem I'm going to tell you precisely what it says. The counting theorem tells you that you know there aren't too many rational points on on definable sets unless unless I have to. So we have lots of rational points and it comes from algebra. But if it's really transcendental, there have to be a few, small number of rational points on on your definable set. And uh, but I think it was uh, Humberto Zanier who had the had the idea of Jonathan Newbridge's fragment. Yeah. You both have your name on this paper, so maybe it was your idea. And so it was, so it's his idea that actually this these kinds of bounds should have consequences for diaphragm time problems. And this uh, first test of concepts is a reproof of the Madame Humphrey conjecture. Uh, yes, for abelian varieties defined over the algebraic numbers, uh, just by playing off. So lower bounds make it from Galois theory against upper bounds that you get from this counting. And not to show that the structure of the, of the sets you get the intersection and torsion points have to come from groups. So uh, Philip is going to talk in detail about this, about this particular example. And most of the other kinds of applications that we've, you know, that we'll be discussing in this conference derive from, derive from this principle. So what does the theorem say? I'm going to tell you what the theorem says. Say a little something about how it's proven, but not not a big detail. So first, I just need to give some give notation. Uh, so we'll talk about the multiplicative heights on the rational numbers, where you write a number in as uh, a fraction. And the multiplicative heights is the maximum size the absolute values in the numerator. 
uh, unless zero, in which case is zero. Okay, so if it, because you can write zero is zero divided by a huge number, and the height is not huge, the height is zero. In the case of zero. Uh, we extend the height function to tuples. First, there are lots of ways you could do it, you just do this naive way where you just take the max. Okay? And then if you have any set whatsoever, you're going to basically, basically I want to have some way of taking a set and counting rational points in it. Now there might be infinitely rational points. So you decompose the rational points into the rational numbers up through some given height. There are some roughly t to the n uh, points of, of heights n in the whole space. And so restrict some subset to smaller, you count how many of those are. And the set of rational points of height up to t, well, that's what it is. Points in x are rational, and the height is supposed to t. Now, this notation, uh, the x alg notation, might be a little bit annoying because usually I think of it as meaning take the algebraic closure of a field. That's not what I'm doing. It means the parts of x which, which you can define just using some algebraic geometry. So it's the union of all of the positive dimensional connected some algebraic sets in that of x. Now, what you'd really like to say, you'd like it to be just the largest semi algebraic set inside of X, but that might not be the largest semi algebraic set inside of X. It might be that there's some time many curves or something which give you this weird looking semi algebraic thing, or not a semi algebraic union semi algebraic sets. It could be, for example, let's say that X, if X were some transcendental thing, like it's everything below the graph of the exponential function. So well, it's just two dimensional sets inside of the plane. That's transcendental. The algebraic part would be everything, because all the balls that you have under the exponential function, there are so those are semi-algebraic. And so if you take the union of all of those all the balls, that's everything. So the algebraic part could be big, even though your set X is is itself highly transcendental. Uh, you know, just keep that in mind. I think you actually want to want to apply this. Anything? No. Yes. Yeah, so yes. The question was: Is the is X algebra definable? Sometimes, but sometimes it's not. And uh, I think that's the example, the standard example that people give where you see it's not definable would be to look at the graph of power, you know, the X, Y, and Z, where Z is X to the Y, make X, Y, and Z all positive. That's definable in the structure of the real the exponential function, which is all minimal. I haven't explained what it is, but it is. Okay? So that's a definable set. And you can check that the graphs of Powers, rational powers are all semi algebraic. And that's it. Those are the only semi algebraic sets that you get inside of there. And the unions, I guess, countable union of definable sets, but not self, not self defined. Here we call a transcendental part that's left. And the counting theorem says that there are, okay, we say sub polynomially, but it's the polynomial is actually with respect to a fractional power. Uh, no, well, in any case, that's what we say. So just sub polynomially many rational points on the transcendental part of the definable set. So you take X, it's a subset of R to the N, and I really mean I really mean that R, the real numbers, because we're counting rational numbers here. It's definable in some ominous structure on the real numbers. Okay. Uh, so it's not all the I mean, it's tiny, but... Uh, yeah, some ominous structure on this, and then should be dot dot dot. So expanding that. And it's also true in there, but it's kind of stupid. <laughs> in that case, uh, because in that case, I guess the transcendental part would always be empty. <laughs> but do you want the expansion of the real field, or, or is it for any other? Uh, oh, the real field, yeah. So we, it, it's ominous structure on the real field, yeah. So it's been a real field. Or you can just say that you're on X. No, I don't think that's good enough. Well, no, I don't get. Yeah, I'm not sure that's good enough because you could do some weird homeomorphism where you, yeah. So let's let's just be. I'll be safe. I'll say it's actually it's an expansion of the real field. Expansion of the real field. Probably you should just add the field then. Might make you minimal. It might be minimal if you do it. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a way that you can make it minimal when it's expansion just by adding x. But it was not a minimal when you throw in the field structure. So yeah, with the field structure, no, expansion of the real field. So I take that way. It's exactly because you need to find a choice in the proof. That's why I was asking you. Well, it's 
you need a lot of things. You need definable choice. You need you need differentiability. Mm. You need a lot of things. Okay, so you really need the field. Yeah, so you need definable choice, but you also need parameterization by uh, k times differentiable functions, which doesn't make any sense if you don't have the field structure. What, what about this? Metals is touching the definition of uh, tangents is reversed. <laughs> well, okay, maybe we're going to have the field. Okay, we have the field. Okay. So it's x is definable, but it's only really interesting when it's more than just the field, or at least the statement of the of this form of the of the theorem. And for every epsilon, find a constant so that the number of rational points at height up to t. Uh, except for all t bigger than zero, I think actually with t bigger than one, which stupid things happen in the, the small values. So, so for all t, for all t bigger than one, the number of of uh, rational points and heights up to t is bounded by that constant time t to the epsilon. Okay. So, if fewer than square root of t, fewer than the cube root of t, that's any power that you put there, you have fewer rational points. X has to be bounded or not necessarily? Not necessarily. It's, you see, remember when we were defining the sets here, the, the uh, you know, the X cubed T, well, this set, the set of points of heights at most T, that's that's a bounded set. Okay, so when we're counting dots, that's going to be bounded. But from the statement of the theorem, no, X is not actually bounded. So if you're looking at rational points and scanning for the, for the whole field. You might as well take the bounds when the proof what you end up doing is you break up into the case where x is actually inside of the interval between you know, the box from zero to one. And that's because you can move everything around by by using you know by using the uh, inverses. Uh, you can cut up the, cut up your, your entire space r to the n into some finite number of pieces, each of which you can put into the box and then you count for the box. So in a proof, you, you deal with bounded sets. But the conclusion is wrong. But what's the actual rows here? It's less than t to the epsilon for any epsilon. What's what? What's the actual gross here? I mean, what's the truth? Oh, well, that's a good question. Yeah, so can it's, you give logarithmic bounds? Can you think? Well, <laughs> that's a very good question. Uh, yes, for sharply ono structures, yes. And uh, even for something that is not sharply or not known to sharply at all, yes, it would to be logarithmic. It's there are examples known where you cannot replace the t to the epsilons with the power to logarithm, uh, although they're like ad hoc. The, the, the sets that you define you use kind of Louisville kind of constructions, and you know, they don't satisfy any differential equations, they wouldn't be something you just naturally look at, but they at least show that you can't, you can't in complete generality bring this to better than. Uh, powers, you know, what is the powers? Please, 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 yeah, I'll tell you. I'm okay. Yeah, but I mean, there are but, examples where you just take an analytic function. I think by Jonathan or maybe Jonathan attributed to Bouvier, where you take analytic function and you get uh, as close as you want to this. So for any sequence that's slower than t to the epsilon for any epsilon, mm -hmm. there is a function that has at least these many mm -hmm. rational points. Right? Just an uh, analytic function on the unit disk. So it doesn't have to be very wild. <clears throat> Not very wild, but you're doing it, but you're doing it just by some interpolation. Some kind of lacunary type construction. Hmm. All right, so what's involved in the proof? Uh, well, I'm going to tell you because I will. Yeah, I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to, I'm going to say this now, and then tomorrow I'll be explaining this. Explain this actually, explain it. I'll let you think about this. All right? Hmm. Okay. What? Okay, because all night thinking about it and like it'll make perfect sense for perfect sense by tomorrow. Yeah. Basically, the the trick uh, is you need to have some way to recognize when points lie on surfaces on hypersurfaces. And the trick is what goes in the name of this determinant method. 
Uh, so here's some notation here. Uh, when I write some tuple raised to a multi index, it just means that you raise these coordinates to their different powers. And this is an observation, and it's an observation maybe I, I should have written out the matrices, right? The matrices, and you just right, you see it. <laughs> well, this is, uh, you know, to say that you have a linear dependence amongst these powers. And, you know, to say you have a bunch of points in R to the end, you want to know, do they all lie on a common hypersurface of some given degree? Yeah, of degree D. Saying they all lie on the same hypersurface of degree D, or some D, maybe, and the coefficients might be real numbers, I'm not saying the graph numbers are but real numbers. If and only if, whenever you take a subset of these guys where the number is equal to the number of is the monomials you get when you're looking at equations of degree up to the D. The matrix that you form by taking these points and raising all the powers is singular. Okay. Because to say this is singular would mean that the that as you move across the mu's, there's linear dependence. That's exactly saying that's that's the equation which says the sum of the coefficients times x to the new power vanishes on these points. Uh, so you look at these look at the, you look at these these determinants. And so the observation which is then used is that if you have rational numbers, you know that the denominator is not too big, and you compute a determinant of one of these guys, one of these kinds of guys, either it's zero or it's not zero. And if it's not zero, it has to be at least one over the size of the denominator raised to of the number of terms in that determinant. I guess time is constant. So uh, I'll explain tomorrow why this matters. Okay, so I mean how this is how this is actually used in you know, improving the improving the counting. Term. But it's really this very simple simple observation that's checking for these dependencies, these algebraic dependencies on the points is something that you can see with this determinantal condition, uh, which makes all the number theoretic parts of the of the computation work. In the, in this context. And then there's some other knowledge which goes into Okay, so that'll be it for today. And so I'll, I'll finish it. Any other questions for what? Why is it Oh, you know. Oh, okay. so, yeah, so, uh, there's the refinements. Refinement is actually there's a statement which works for all uh, all numbers that are in some number of fields of uh, some fixed degree. Oh no, you don't have to restrict the cube. Other questions? Okay, let's thank Thomas again. Would you look at 11?